We have something juicy to talk about. This is like about Facebook and YouTube and how it's affecting you and manipulating you, and it's a super timely topic. So we're thrilled to have here Doug Rushkoff, who is an eminent um, writer on uh, digital, you know, the digital world and, and social media and what it does to us as a people and a society. Um, but for him, it's not just like a snapshot of the moment. It's actually a long-running picture because he's been covering this evolving field ever since he got his PhD, maybe before, and then went off and started writing like 20 books on this, um, TV documentaries, podcasts, um, fiction, graphic novels, and media columns. Um, for all this brilliant work, uh, MIT called him one of the world's 10 most in influential intellectuals. He's coined such terms, this is the guy, as viral media and social currency. He is taught widely, um, including founding the Laboratory for Digital Humanism at Queens College. Um, and if I haven't already made the point that he's a Renaissance person, uh, let me add that he's worked as a certified stage fight choreographer and as a keyboardist for the industrial band Psychic TV. That's in your bio biography. Yeah, it's, it's pretty impressive. My proudest moments. Um, so, and we'll get, uh, I just... PhD, just so you know, I got the PhD when I was 50. I've been doing this for 20, 25 uh, years and doing talks about the economy in places like Germany and having guys stand up and say, excuse me, Mr. Rushkoff, what is your background? As if, you know, I'm some, some charlatan and I would just turn and go, oh, well, blue. You know, so I got the PhD just so I could be like, you know, fuck you. Uh, you know, like, believe me, you know. So it was more of an afterthought than, than like, so you don't need one unless you just want to. Well, it's better when they come to you later with it, yes. Um, Doug's latest book is called Team Human, and it comes with this amazing poster-like jacket. Um, by the way, there was a big pile in the lobby, but they're very popular, and if you go out there and there's none left, there's a little sheet. If you sign it, we'll, we'll send you one. Aww. It's an amazing book. Um, the front is like a, kind of an elevator pitch for the book. It's, uh, our technologies, markets, and cultural institutions once forces for human connection and expression now isolate and repress us. It's time to remake society together, not as individual players, but as a team we actually are. And in the back, there's a clue to the, uh, the prescription here, find the others. It's, it's a, a pretty intriguing book. Um, now, it's like supposed to be, but no one got it, a double entendre there, that you're supposed to put on the back of the book, you're supposed to put your blurbs, who would be like my team, right, my others. But then by putting find the others, the idea is, that's just like one of the last times yeah. I'm going to talk about the book. The idea was, no, go find your others. You know, don't, don't worry about mine. And you have great blurbs, too, Walter Isaacson. Walter. They're Anyhow, they're, they're terrific. Anyhow, so, Doug, um, my first question. Before we talk about the current book, I wanted to talk about a couple of earlier ones in which you were starting to, to see what was evolving in terms of digital media. And the first one was called, one of the first, was called uh, Media Virus, Hidden Agendas in Popular Culture in which you talked about the O.J. Simpson police chase as a kind of watershed moment about how we regard media and what, it, what its inf uh, influence on us. Was this kind of a foreshadowing now, now that we're here of how we got here? Kind of? Yeah, I mean, whoa, this mic's no good. All right. Um, yeah, in some ways, and I, I think I wrote about this, I feel like the Trump election is the bookend to the, the O.J. Simpson trial. <laughs> it's just good. like as if like two wrongs make a right or something it's some weird there's some weird weird connection there but yeah i mean the cool thing uh, i wrote media virus back when the rodney king tape happened and spread around and it was this it was this real moment of sort of camcorder people's power through digital bottom-up media and the O.J. Simpson thing happened, and Michael Jackson, and Madonna, and Woody Allen, and Soon Yi, and Amy Fisher, and Joey Buttafuoco, remember them? There were these phenomena that seemed to be happening in a newly lateral media, in a, very, in a kind of horizontal media space. There was no web yet, but there were camcorders, and VCRs, and fax machines, and there was email, and there were the beginnings of computer viruses. So I started to think about, well, ideas are not just being dropped down from the top by William Randolph Hearst. You know, now they're coming up from the bottom and the only thing that's really gonna determine whether an idea spreads is whether the, the media form that it's in is somehow novel or strange or sticky. And if the memes, the ideas inside it are challenging our uh, cultural code. 
You know, so if, if we're not having a good public discussion about, you know, um, race relations or police brutality or whatever, then those things are, are, are much more likely to provoke uh, an immune response than, than things that we've, than we've actually dealt with. So yeah, I was, I was at the time almost, uh, almost completely positive about this because I thought that, that there would be almost like this sort of free market of ideas now. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't be able to shove stuff down our throat. And, and the OJ moment was like this, for me, this quantum physics kind of moment. Because if you lived in LA when the chase was happening, you'd see this kind of slow, he was going really slow, like listening to the game or something, I forgot <laughs> what. He was going super slow. And if you saw the chase was coming to your neighborhood, you could like run out and like get on your own TV screen by getting out to the overpass in time when the thing went by. So it was this weird participatory, slow motion, strange uh, uh, moment that, that, that was, you know, and I wrote a lot about it, but it was sort of, it was, it was uh, uh, watershed in that, it, in that it, it just changed our relationship to the screen. It sort of, it, it was the beginning of like cops and reality TV and this whole different way of understanding what we, you know, what we now call reality, but this sort of fake nonfiction uh, news media. Well, now fast forward um, to three years ago, and you published uh, Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus, which was kind of a, a local thing, I think, in some, to some degree, but now you're three years ahead of your time, there's this huge backlash against big tech. And it seems to have something to do with growth at any cost and the kind of a, their whole business model. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, that was a funny one. That's the, the, the bad thing about being slightly ahead is I don't make as much money. You know, or and I got to go to my editor when I was trying to write that book, and I was explaining to this editor at, or that publisher at, at, at Portfolio. It's like, well, you know, the growth-based economy has reached its limits, and we're growing at the expense of real people and places, and then these giant digital companies—they're more extractive than they are circulatory or additive. And he's like, "You're crazy." He said, "What are you talking about? Growth without growth, we have no economy. Growth is the underlying premise of the whole thing. Without growth, of course, you need growth. What do you mean, no growth?" And he's like, so now people are like, oh, I get it. Um, but yeah, the throwing rocks to the Google bus that was, was originally, I was, had a positive title for that. It was going to be called Distributed Operating System for a Digital Economy. But they really <laughs> loved that. The moment. editor. Yeah. <laughs> they the loved that moment it, yeah. I talk about at the beginning of the book, which was, you know, when people started um, lying down in front of the Google buses that were being used to ferry the employees from San Francisco down to Mountain View. It was as if San Francisco was sort of this Disney backdrop for digital employees to feel good about themselves while they're actually working somewhere else. And, and, and they were using, you know, public bus stops to transport these, you know, uh, employees back to the mothership. And people felt, you know, they couldn't afford San Francisco anymore. And if you lived within walking distance of a, one of those bus stops, your, your rent was even one third higher than elsewhere. So it seemed to be this kind of perfect image for how could, you know, two kids from Stanford who started this company in their dorm room to take down the big bad Yahoo Corporation through peer-to-peer -peer links and things, how did they become uh, uh, not only so huge, but how did they become such a, to have such negative impact on the real people and real places where they were operating? So it, for me, it became a great, not just a metaphor, but an example of the way of these companies are just sucking all the money off the table. You know, it's what corporations have done since British East India, you know, in the, in the 1300s, but we watched it happen in like 10 years, what it took, you know, uh, uh, it took uh, industrialism 400 years to do. You could see Uber, just, and they suck it out, and, and they end up in this state of kind of uh, uh, corporate obesity, where they've taken in all the money, but they don't know how to deploy it anymore. You know, corporate profit over size has been decreasing for 75 years, which means they can, they can extract all the money from a marketplace, but once they have it, they don't know how to, to do anything with it. All they can do is then buy something else or destroy another market. When you, early in the days of the internet, there was a sense that it was going to help the counterculture almost. It was a democratizing thing, and it was the new frontier and, and so on, and then uh, that changed dramatically and to the point where, no, these are now like monopolies. That's a, a long timeline, but if you can give us a... Oh, it's a short time. Accelerated. Line, really. I mean, yeah. well, maybe I'm old, but 20, 25 years in, in, in terms of human history, is a, it's really short yeah. that, that something can happen that fast. I mean, 
you know, there's Walmarts that have lasted longer than 25 years, even though they're extractive. So 25 years is, is, is short. But what, what the way I look at it, and maybe I look at too much this way, but the way I look at it is with kind of as, as psychedelics. You know, when, when I first showed Timothy Leary, I was the person who put him on, on the web for the first time. And he said, wow, Doug, this is as powerful as LSD. This is the acid we've been waiting for. <laughs> and what, at the time, you know, the, the idea when you take acid, as Leary used to, to recommend, you, what's going to determine the quality of your trip is the set and setting that you bring to it. What's your mindset and what setting are you doing it in? And the mindset and setting of the original internet culture was, how are we going to link up all human beings into one collective brain and shepherd Gaia through the next stage of evolution to pure consciousness? I mean, that was a nice set and setting. How are we going to connect all the underprivileged people? How are we going to you know, bring the so-called developing world together with us and provide access for all those? Were, that was the set and setting. But then along came Wired magazine with a very different set and setting, right? Theirs was the set and setting of, of uh-oh, we lost this one now. Dude, this battery was low. Do we have to record or can I just go loud? I'll go loud for now. This one? Oh, it's back. Um, but this, I was scary, huh? Um, <laughs> the, the set and setting of the internet became, uh, ex you know, to, to grow the NASDAQ stock exchange by any means necessary and to do it with a attention and surveillance-based economy. So if you have an attention surveillance-based economy that's extracting value from people by any means necessary in order to grow these sort of non-player character monster corporations, then what do you think is going to happen? Right? We've been living on a psychedelic substrate for the past 25 years with a set and setting of surveillance and extraction, and no wonder we're having this bad trip. Right? That's what's going on. And so anything, can, can any one tweet right, can send you down a rabbit hole into despair. What does that feel like? What does that sound like? Right? You remember the dorm room trip, that one, right? <laughs> that's, that's the experience we're having. So once you see that, it actually, it gives me a little hope just to go, oh man, they're just tripping, right? They're just tripping. And we can somehow bring them back to, uh, uh, to, to a, a more positive uh, consciousness than, than we'll be a whole lot better off. Well, let me ask you about how and people who use social media can t feel this from the, what the algorithms can do in the sense of like you have a thousand friends on Facebook, but why do I always see the same few, you know, and so that sort of thing. So how does, um, how does social media, social, tend to socially isolate us? Well, it's by design, <laughs> right? Tell us about that. Well, yeah. I mean, the funny thing is, you know, I, I used to think, and I still do, I guess, I, I used to write that the internet is remedial help for a society that's been desocialized through television. That television was everyone has their own channel or their own show and we're all just isolated and we're, we're these sort of targeted consumers. Because what they learned in the television age was the way to sell you something is if you're alone and don't have friendships, right? You're not gonna buy blue jeans or perfume if you already are getting laid or have friends or enjoying, right? It's, it's the, the, the blue jeans commercial is designed for the person who's not getting laid. Wear these jeans, you will get laid. So television's, it's, it's, it's collateral damage was to individuate everybody so that everyone needs to purchase things in order to reconnect with those people who they're never going to see because they're watching This has happened shows. before. This is a right. cycle that goes on. Yeah. And the internet, we thought, was, oh, now we're going to reach through our screens and find the others and connect, and, and that will be the baby steps through. Then we can even step outside and see another human. You know, I'm going to learn that people don't all hate me and and it's, it felt like this beginning of something. But the problem was, you know, and they did a study in around 1994 when they found out the average internet connected home was watching nine hours less commercial television a week. And that's a crisis, right? They're, they're not getting their programming. You know, they're not, they're, 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 they're not, they're not receiving their, 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 their messaging. So that had to be stopped. And all of the, the liberative technologies, the remote control, the joystick, the mouse, the keyboard, they were all demonized, right? The remote control that kids were using to watch television and, by, you know, get away from the captive spell whenever they feel that, that pull, they bam, that was called attention deficit disorder. 
right? These kids were drugged, right? Anyone who's trying to get away from a captive programmer is considered pathological on some level. You know, the, the demystification of the screen was remystified with things like Windows. You know, what do you use? Even as early as 96, 97, what did you use to install a program in Windows? Something they called the wizard, right? Why did they pick the wizard as the metaphor instead of the helper, the hardware, the plumber, the, the dude? It was the wizard because it's saying, you don't know how to work this stuff. Stay away, you know? And, and finally, you know, they, they, they realize that they're going to get more from us by mining our data than even by selling us products, you know? And that's just keeping people, you know, and, and there's a lot of people have talked about this at, at this point over the last five or ten years, you know, to addict people by any means necessary to the devices and get them to, to touch more things so we get more data from them, that every swipe that you make of your phone, your phone gets smarter about you. Or you go to, if you're a developer, you go to Stanford and go to B.J. Fogg's class in captology. That's what they teach. He's got a laboratory in captology, and it's exactly what it sounds like. How do we use these technologies to addict people to apps and to modify their behavior? So that's, I mean... Captivating used to be a positive word, you know? Yeah. It's sort of, but wow. Captive and captivation, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, um, so how, if the whole business model is built around, like, following you and watching you and, and addicting you and giving you YouTube videos over and over that are just like what you Making you, you into want. a more extreme and predictable version of yourself. Literally right. dehumanizing you. Auto-tuning your behavior to be category A or category B, but none of that weird David Lynchy stuff in the middle. <laughs> or any serendipity. But um, so how do they, if that's the business model, how does that, they're not the big tech, you know, Google, Facebook, and so on, are not going to give that up very willingly. So do you think there's like a titanic clash coming? It seems to be with, with um, Elizabeth Warren and several other politicians saying we've got to break them up, we've got to tax them, we've got to regulate them. Um, what's your thought on, like, will any progress be made? Um, well, mate, I'm, I'm weird in that I try not to look at them and think about them even. In other words, uh, yeah, break them up, do bad things, pull out their toenails, whatever. You know, yeah. Um, I mean, but breaking, I don't know if breaking them up breaks them up or just leads to like the thousand little brooms. And M Mickey, remember Mickey was Sorcerer's Apprentice and then all the little brooms are coming? So it's like, I don't know if it, I don't know if it helps or not. This is what, what I'm trying to focus on instead, well, are, are a couple of things. One is, is kind of trying to retrieve our human immune response. You know, I feel like, like basic rapport, being able to make eye contact, being in rooms with other people, that's the precursor to solidarity. And solidarity is what we need in order to have any power. So, you know, sitting alone and tweeting that Elizabeth Warren should break up Amazon, sure, good, go for it. But it still doesn't, it doesn't, establish a basic social fabric. You know, I was more excited by, you know, uh, the protests against Amazon setting up Headquarter 2 or whatever they were going to call it in Queens because that was real people in a real local neighborhood deciding, no, this, this local reality means more. So that kind of uh, uh, political activity uh, means a lot to me. But also I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that it's way easier to build a Facebook today than it was 10, 20 years ago when he built it, that you could, we could all move, you know, we could. And, and I don't know that it would be a titanic clash as much as a long, slow hiss whimper. You know, like what happened to Yahoo? What happened to AOL? People thought AOL was friggin' invincible when they nice bought place. Time Warner, that that was gonna be just it. And Steve Case, people don't even know his name anymore, Steve Case was gonna own the world. And look what happened there. Don't remind me, I used to work there. Um, at any rate, uh, <laughs> what a mess that was. Um, there's, I want to talk about like Team Human and the Renaissance, like, okay, the, you know, how do we get, get out of this? But there are like dozens of really f amazing facts in this book about um, just a, a digital phenomenon. Actually, there's 100, because it's numbered one through 100 uh, insights, um, a cool structure. But I was wondering about how digital technology kind of removes the human nuances in art, and especially, like for example in music, you mentioned how, um, um, because you are a musician, about how Ringo Starr and the Beatles, you know, a, a drummer for the Beatles of course, um, 
actually played off, he, right? And he was, it was his distinctive thing. And if, if in the you know, lab today or the sound studio, that would be just all fixed. Right. Just, just, could you tell us a little bit about like that? Yeah, I mean, I think, and we all know that digital is quantized, and that's cool. That's part of why it figured out so much stuff, you know. That, but that, that it's still just a map. It's a representation. It's a symbol system. Not, it's not uh, reality. That reality has all these in-between, all these liminal places. And I feel like that, that living in a digital media environment really emphasizes our utility value. Certainly as, as workers and as people, how much have you done? What have you produced? It's partly industrial age values expressing themselves through digital technology, but it's very, it, it's very utilitarian, very uh, metric oriented. And what we, we lose sight of, I think, is kind of our essential value as human beings. And that's where it gets weird and tricky and dangerous to even talk about it because it starts to sound too like, oh no, are you talking about God or something? But we don't talk about God, but talk about soul. Right, the human soul as the sort of the formal cause of being human is your is your soul. This sort of if that's the pre-existing thing, if that's the essential nature, or if you don't like the soul, just think about soul. You know, soul has no place in the digital media environment. If you're auto-tuning your vocalist, then what happens to James Brown? Right, when he's reaching up for the note or coming down over the note, you you. You, you auto-tune him, and you start looking, and we do now. We look at being off the quantum note. We look at that, we call it noise. Right? Oh, that's noise. Let's just go to there. Or like DNA that we don't know what it is. That's junk DNA. That's just junk, whatever. And it's like, no, that's our fossil record. That's our history. Maybe, you know, we don't want to just throw that away. So all this stuff that we look at as noise, I'm seeing as signal. I'm seeing that as these are the ways that we know that we're not machines. These are the parts of us that art and, and culture and, and spirit, that those are the parts that they celebrate and amplify. And we're just, uh, I feel that the market is so uncomfortable with those things. Uh, commercial audiences are so, are trained to be uncomfortable with those things. I paid my 12, 15 bucks to see this movie. I damn well sure want to know how it ends. No, where I'm going to pay 15 bucks for a movie, I don't want to know. I want there to be 30 endings. I want to have to go back to figure out what the fuck happened. You know, I want it to be, I want it to be uh, opening and strange and not, oh, it's not one of these or one of those. It's one of this. It's like, you know, and that's where, you know, that's where beauty happens. That's, that's the, the best I can say it, that's the thing that humans have over machines is that we can engage with ambiguity and we can sustain ambiguity over time. We don't have to resolve it to a one or a zero. We can stay in that liminal place. And that's where, I think, that's where we find our value. That's where we find our ability to genuinely connect with others. Um, you have a section in the book called Renaissance, which is looking forward by looking back. Can you tell us about that? About that? How we, and then how we yeah. Go toward team human. I mean, I, I became interested in Renaissance really for two reasons. One, because I've always been interested to understand if this digital moment is a Renaissance. So back in like 1990, 91, when I was on the well and I started to talk to people about this moment, I, would, I started this little uh, topic called Renaissance Now that ran for like a year and thousands of comments where we were, or, or they weren't called comments at the time, they're just posts on a BBS. Um, going back and forth about, you know, what are the things in our, in our society that are, uh, or in our civilization that are analogous to what happened in the original Renaissance. So you remember in the Renaissance, they circumnavigated the globe and in our Renaissance, we orbited the globe and shot a picture of it from, from above. In the original Renaissance, they got perspective painting. We got the holograph. So you could look at, you know, all these different parallels between that time and this one. And that, was interesting to me in itself. But then when I look at, when I started to do my analysis of the economy and where we went wrong and why, why corporations are the way they are, why we have central currency that's a monopoly currency, extracting money from people, I realized, oh, this all happened. 
at the beginning of the Renaissance. That's when we got the chartered monopoly. That's when we got central currency. And neither of those things were invented to promote this natural evolution of business. Both of them were invented to squash a peer-to-peer -peer culture and a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace that had emerged after the Crusades in late medieval Europe. People were getting wealthy. The former peasants became the burghers, the, the bourgeois is what they were called, and the aristocracy was getting poor. So they made money illegal. If you wanted to trade, you had to borrow money from the central treasury at interest. Small business was made illegal. You now had to be an employee of one of the chartered monopolies that were paying money back to the king. So when I thought about if we're in the midst of a renaissance, then what happens is we get to retrieve the values that were repressed in the last Renaissance. You know, things like, like women, you know, or things like, like city-states as opposed to nation-states, um, local currencies and local business and small business and all of that kind of peer-to-peer -peer culture. But whenever I talk about that in business audiences, they'll say, oh, Rushkoff wants us to go back to medieval times. And we, should, we all know, we all watched Game of Thrones, it wasn't nice then. Uh, <laughs> and, I'm not saying we go back to medieval times, but that we, just like the re original Renaissance retrieved the values of ancient Roman Greece, that we retrieve the values of late medievalism. And that's what we're seeing. That's what Bernie Man and Etsy and crafting and all these things we can joke about are actually medieval values coming back. Local currencies, complementary, Bitcoin, um, all of these are have a, have a, a late medieval sensibility. These are the things that were forcibly outlawed or repressed that we need to, to bring back if we're going to sort of offset this, this imbalance of, of those, uh, those Renaissance ideals. I have a few more questions, but we only have a few, few more minutes. So if anyone has a question in the audience, now's a good time to raise a hand. We have microphones. Anybody want to fire one at Doug there? Come on. Okay. Well, I'll ask one on your behalf. Which is, a lot of these people out here, a lot of people are working for big companies, and they are in the, the people-focused parts of the companies, like human resources and human capital and, and uh, corporate social responsibility. They want to do good. They want to, and, you know, there are big companies, like maybe if you work um, for AT&T, but you, you want to do, um, do the right thing, but it's a ginormous company. What, what advice would you give people about other than Team quitting, human. right, um, which is always an option. Um, no, I would just say, you know, d figure out what your, what your sensibilities are and what it is you want to see happen, and then use every meeting, every decision point as a way to move things closer to that. You know, companies get scared if you try to suggest to them to change, but they're really happy to do virtue signaling of one kind or another. And the trick that I've, I've been able to pull sometimes is to do something and say, oh, look, this will be a great public relations thing. Just do it as a trial. Right? You don't have to really do it, but just kind of try this out. You know, like a, a, a bank, you know, uh, for them not just to give loans to small businesses, but to, uh, uh, to let small businesses also do local crowdfunding to support the loan rather than borrowing it all from the bank or just little things. You can think of, of trials and experiments. Um, try to help. Uh, uh, most businesses don't understand that poor customers are bad customers, you know, to try to help convince companies that if they're, if they're employees and suppliers and uh, people in their, in their uh, uh, marketplace, if they're doing well, they're going to have more money to spend with you. You know, it's just to try to help them think about, do you really want to squeeze this other party in your transaction? Do you want to squeeze them to death? Is that worth it? Or do you want them to be happy that they've done business with you? You know, it's kind of the opposite of that Shark Tank philosophy where if you haven't sweat and you're, if you're not upset, then I didn't do a good deal. It's like, no, what if they're happy? You know, to, to, to consider that. Uh, it, it's, not a, it's not impossible. You just have to do it so they don't feel like the whole ship is turning. It's just one little deal, one little experiment. Let's see if we make these people happy if they do more business with us rather than less. Uh, you've been um, on the road promoting your book, and you said, um, uh, you told me that one of the most frequent questions you get from the audience is, is it too late to change our relationship with technology? Is it, what do you tell people? 
Well, being alive means it's not too late. <laughs> you know, it's the same as is it too late to change our relationship with the with the climate? I mean, no, it's not too late. I mean, there, we'll know when it's too late, right? They'll, it'll be too late. Um, <laughs> Um, no, it's never too late. As long as you're alive, you know, you just have to, we have to, I think we have to, to, incremental change has gotten such a bad name, you know, but incremental change is, 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 is real, you know, and I would, you know, you, you can get in, you'll get into a, a, a positive reinforcement loop if you set really small goals, like to start, you're talking about the AT&T person, I'm going to make eye contact with one person at work today. You know, to start with a goal that little. And you know what I mean? And do that and, and feel it. And then see where, see where that takes you. You know what I mean? I, I would say, go there. And then you'll know, of course it's not too late. Of course, there are others. They're out there. There's a, there's a, a, I, I feel like what we're doing is, is enacting a conspiracy of the best kind. Conspire literally means breathe together, right? Conspire. Hmm. You know, and if we can start that, start that just breathe together with other people, I really, I, the, the rest will follow. You're educated. You know what's going on. We're, we're, we're all, you know, social justice warriors in our own, in our own way. It's just you can't do it alone. You can't do it on Twitter. You're going to have to do it, um, you know, with other actual humans. So find people you're comfortable with, then find some people you're not comfortable with and, uh, and, and take it from there. Well, that's a great note to end on uh, for a conference called From Day One. Thank you, Doug. This is terrific. Uh, you put a lot of passion into your scholarship here, so it's great to have you. Thanks. Thank you.